Um, so if you are new to the Zoom format, um, congratulations, you were able to log in, so that's a good start. Um, if you have not muted your microphone, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, we get a lot of feedback um, and it gets kind of hard to hear. Um, to do that, you'll notice in the right-hand corner where you see your, your, your face and your webcam, there'll be a little blue box. If you just kind of scroll over to that area, it'll come on and um, you can mute or and you can also unmute. If you have any problems doing that, just raise your hand because I can do it for you as well. And for those of you that are with us, um, if you don't have a webcam, that's fine. But if you do, we'd appreciate you turning it on. It's nice for everybody to get to see each other's faces. Okay, we've got 27 participants. That's not too bad out of 50. Um, I do know we've got a lot of people um, out of town on vacation. Uh, they, the governor of Louisiana just declared a state of emergency for New Orleans and that area. Um, so some of our people who are down in South Louisiana may not be joining us as well, just because I know they've got a whole lot going on. Um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Tracy Johnson, and I am very excited to teach one of my favorite classes, EDL. Um, I teach several different courses. I've taught, it seems like, everything in the program um, over time. But like I said, this is my very favorite class. I'm a huge believer in professional learning communities, and I have seen them used quite effectively in schools. I've also seen them misused and somewhat abused. So we're going to talk about so many different things related to professional learning communities um, in this course. But tonight, I just wanted to mostly get you kind of introduced to um, uh, the course, what it is we hope to do, give you some pointers and tips, um, let you know what it's like to work with me as a professor. And um, I know earlier as I was doing some grading on the discussion forums, lots of students that I've had before. So to those of you that I've had before, um, I hope that I live up to your expectations. And um, after the meeting, you guys can all stay online, I'll sign out and you can tell everybody the real truth about what it's like to have me as an instructor. Um, so let's just kind of start off. Uh, the whole premise behind uh, this course, EDL 700, Creating Professional Learning Community, is to create something, um, that team sort of collaborative mentality, um, that you can use to really drive instruction and achievement at your schools. There are lots of different ways to do these, uh, but the original model was created by Rick Dufour. He was actually a principal of a high school and he just didn't feel like he was making their school was making the kind of progress they needed. So he developed this idea and this model and it is it's pretty um, didactic I guess for lack of a better word um, in the way that it is implemented. So most everybody in education uh, in the year 2019 has heard the term professional learning communities, um, but that does not mean even if you've participated in a PLC that you've actually done it in the most effective and efficient manner. I won't say there's a wrong way to do them, but I can certainly tell you there's a better way to do them. Um, so we're going to kind of unpack that and talk about, you know, what are the components of a successful uh, PLC? What does that look like in action? What are the kinds of things you should be doing in that PLC meeting? Um, what are the no-nos or the things that should be left um, off the table during that? We're also going to talk about um, how to evaluate the effectiveness of your PLC. And then we're going to get into as well, what do you do when some of those team members aren't quite on board with the rest of the team? Or you may have someone who's actually working against you. How do you deal with those difficult people and those difficult personalities? Um, so but before we get into that kind of work um, that really kind of starts up next week, um, I wanted just to tell you a few things, like I said, that'll help you with the course. So throughout the course, you're basically, it's kind of, it's a pretty simple rotation. So on odd number of weeks, you will be doing a discussion forum. Now, the first week, I know I had you do some readings and some articles and some videos, and then I had you do a discussion forum that introduced yourself. And several of you were like, okay, what do we do regarding these readings and these videos? Keep in mind, there's a ton of reading in this course. Um, so I started the first week, and while you may not use that particular bit of information this week, you might need it in week three. You might need it in week four. You're certainly going to need it by the time you get to the final exam. 
so I distributed it out so that you're not reading 400 pages one week and 30 the next, okay? So there's not always a direct assignment regarding the readings and the videos. It's for you to build that, that cumulative background knowledge so that this course makes sense to you. Um, also, too, I'm, you'll be completing two case studies as well as a final exam. Um, let you know right up front, I don't do quizzes and I don't do tests. This is more about the mastery of the content than it is for you to have to regurgitate something back to me. Um, so, you know, know that that's coming. Um, but when you're thinking ahead towards those case studies and creating your plan of action and all of those things, as we get to them, I will give you templates to complete them. But a lot of people have done some of this work in their school. So if you'd rather use your school's template or whatever, feel free. Because my goal at the end of the course is for you guys to not only know everything you could possibly know about a professional learning community, but I also want to give you some tools and resources that you can take with you and implement when school starts up again or if you're in summer school implement right now i don't want you to do just a bunch of busy work to get a grade in your course i want this to be something that you can use now and on into the future okay does that kind of make sense like i said i want this to be very practical uh, the other thing i want you to do too is um, if there are certain things that i have posted and you really like them and you want to download them you are welcome to do that um, I would encourage you to do it because literally as soon as I post grades, we close the course out and you can't access the content anymore. So like if there's an article, a protocol, a tool, a template uh, that you really like, make sure you download it. Um, yeah, Richard, thank you. So if you've not muted your microphone, I'm looking at everything that looks muted. I can't see who's not. And I hate to call you out, but I'll, I'm going to unmute some uh, if I see it. So give me just a second here. Okay. Sorry, there's, I have to go screen to screen. So give me just one second. Okay, everybody on page one is it good? Let's look at page two. <laughs> okay, I think we may have gotten everybody muted. Is that better? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, my, my, my media is a little bit different sometimes than y'all's because um, I'm here in my lovely 1980s circa paneled office. So I know you're just really enjoying getting to look at this at LSUS. Um, and as an aside, I have moved offices um, five times in the last three months. So this is temporary too. I'm eventually going to a new office. Uh, but if you guys lose me in terms of virtually or on the phone, like I still don't have a working phone. Just know that um, I've moved on average about every two to three weeks. Um, and I am expected to move at least twice more um, here in the next couple of months. The good news is they're doing tons of renovations in LSUS. The bad news is I seem to be the poster child for temporary offices. Um, so I'm going to set the record for me having moved the most um, as an employee of LSUS and the College of Business Building. Um, the other thing too that I just want you to think about, um, I know most of you in having read your posts and, and things like that, you know, you're either in the MEDL program, so that's you're aspiring to be a principal, or you're in the MEDCI program, and you're either looking to, um, you know, really drastically improve your, your repertoire of things and, you know, to become teacher leaders or instructional coaches or whatever. So one of the very best things that um, one of my early, early, early mentors told me to do uh, early on in my career, he's like, I want you to create two folders. Now, I'll let you know how old I am, that for me that was literally folders. For most of you, it's probably going to be a virtual folder or something on your computer. But one of them I labeled everything I want to make sure I do when I'm a principal. It was all the good stuff, you know, it's like, I need mean, then there was the folder of all the things I wanted to make sure I didn't do as a principal. And I will tell you that when I got my first principalship as an elementary principal, and you know, I was young, I, I mean, I was like 29. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, my first principalship was at a, the school I had taught at three years before. 
talk about kind of weird coming back and being the boss of my mentors and the people that helped me as a baby teacher. Um, but I have referred to that folder for years and years and years. I still have it. I still do. Um, I also created a folder with all the nice notes I ever got. Um, now the ones that called me nasty names and stuff, I didn't keep those, but I kept the nice ones. Um, so that, you know, when those days get really challenging, you know, or I'm stuck, um, trying to figure something out, I will pull out those folders and the notes that kind of get me re-energized. So you don't have to do it, but I will tell you, you know, um, I've had other people tell me that's a really helpful piece to do. So let's talk about what it's like to have Tracy Johnson as a professor or as an instructor. Number one, even though the LSU system thinks my name is Tracy Fraley Johnson, I worked really hard to get rid of that uh, former name, Fraley. I went through a, a nice divorce several years ago. My legal name is Tracy Johnson. That's what the federal government knows me as. Everybody in the world knows me as that, except for LSU. So please call me, um, you know, you're welcome to call me Tracy. I'm very informal. Um, you know, if you're gonna address me by my name, I prefer um, that you don't call me by friend. Like I said, I worked really hard to get rid of that. Um, the other thing you need to know too is I have a double major in my bachelor's degree in special education and English. Why does that matter? Um, because I expect you to write like you're a graduate student. Um, so I do look at, I can't help myself. Um, you know, I, I don't red, redline it anymore like I used to when I was teaching, but grammar, usage, all of those things matter. So if you're not very good at it, you might want to ask a friend to proofread stuff before you submit it. Um, I also use um, a, a, a grammar checker for you. you know, in, when you submit your assignments, it will help you with that. Um, I personally keep Grammarly loaded on my computer and so that everything I do, Grammarly's checking it, there's a lot of tools. You're also expected to use APA style. If you're not familiar with APA style writing, it's pretty simple, um, but in your syllabus, I gave you um, the Purdue OWL, and it's literally O-W-L, just Google Purdue OWL um, writing guide. Um, it's very easy to use, it's comprehensive, and it will give you samples of everything that you need to do. Now, with that being said, under APA style, you have, if you're submitting an essay, you would have to have a cover page, an abstract, your actual writing with, with uh, APA style um, citations and a bibliography. I don't require the cover page and I don't require the abstract, but you will need to do APA style in-text citations as well as a bibliography. So a lot of times students lose points because they don't give me that bibliography. Um, so make sure that you do that. Um, the other pet peeve that I have is that um, students sometimes don't use that instructor virtual office like they should. Now, you guys have already been great, so I'm not too worried about you, but those of you especially that have had me before, you know, if somebody posts a question and it takes me a day or two to get to it, and somebody else wants to jump in and answer, go for it. But please check the instructor virtual office pretty regularly because even though it may not be your question that's posted right now, it could be a different question that's posted soon. Um, that's for the benefit of everybody. Now, you guys are professionals and as educators, you're generally pretty nice people, but we've had some problems in the past with our um, some of our business students um, posting some not so nice things about others in that forum. That is not the place to do it. If you've got a concern about another student or you have a concern about me, um, you know, please don't post that publicly. That's just not the way we handle things. Um, if you have a problem with me, um, I'll be happy to send you on to my boss and, and let them address it. But um, like I said, let's keep it really professional shouldn't be a problem. Also too, you're gonna to get lots of tools um, and I post a lot of stuff. Um, I don't post it just for fun. I'm not trying to overwhelm you, but hopefully I'm giving you things um, that are gonna be helpful to you. So for example, um, in next week's module, I posted an additional article. You don't have to read it, but it might be really helpful again, just to build that schema and background knowledge as we prepare for everything. Um, so, Last and finally, um, you know, some questions. Obviously, you guys are here for Zoom, but I know life happens, uh, you know, especially during the summer. Everybody has vacations and all that kind of stuff. I do record the Zoom meetings and I will post them back in Moodle um, at 
but I usually do it the same day we have a Moodle, uh, a Zoom meeting, so you should see it pretty quickly. I will also send out the video link as an announcement um, right after as well. I try to get everything as far as like the night's presentation posted um, at least by the morning of the day of our Zoom meeting, um, but you know, sometimes life happens and I don't get it posted in time, but you will be given a presentation. We will have a total of six Zoom meetings, um, and that presentation is just a good guide for you to use and follow. Um, let's see, late assignments. You've probably read the syllabus and know our policy, but like I said too, I'm also a very practical person. Um, you know, I spent 37 years, oh my gosh, that's a long time, in public education, um, as well as private education. I only did four years in private ed. Um, so I know what life is like. Um, and I know our class is gonna carry over into that time when you're starting school. I remember vividly, I still feel weird the night before school starts in our in my community that I'm not like all hyper freaked out about school starting the next day because that's what I did my whole life. Um, I understand what that cycle's like. So just give me the heads up. Say, hey, I teach in blah, 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 district and or parish, and this is our first week of school. You know, can I get can I get a reprieve on an assignment? I will work with you. Just please communicate with me. Um, so don't freak out if you can't get an assignment to me by the deadline. Um, you know, just like I said, I'll work with you because I know what it's like to be in your shoes. I, I understand that. Now, with that being said, though, I have seen some students get themselves into trouble because they take that grace period in terms of an assignment, and they're like, oh, you know, I, well, I don't have to turn that in this week. Tracy said I could be late with it. The course moves pretty rapidly after about the second week in that you will have odd weeks you have a discussion forum posting, even weeks you have a reflective essay. Then I throw in about week three, your first case study, then you get another case study week four, then you have your final exam week seven. So don't put all of that off until the very last minute because it can be really overwhelming at that point. Try to stay on top of things for your own sake, okay? Um, textbooks. I've given you a couple of optional textbooks. Um, you know, I know I have a professional library that I maintain. Um, if you're one of those people that does that, you know, they are great books to have on your shelf. I'm just telling you, they're books that you will refer to often. Uh, you may want to suggest if you have a professional library at your school that maybe if you guys don't have copies of those books, it might be a nice addition. Um, but like I said, they're, you know, they're completely optional. If you never even think about that textbook, you're going to be fine in the course because I will provide everything that you need. Um, I will try to not to put out um, more than a couple of announcements a week, uh, but do check those. Um, now, I know some people get concerned because with the announcements and the replies and all that, it can get a little bit overwhelming and fill your inbox up. Um, if that starts to happen, just let me know and I'll change the type of subscription that we're using to help with that. And let me see, was there anything else? No, I think that's really kind of it. Do you guys have any questions just in general? Um, I'll tell you, I'm very transparent. I tend to be a lot on the blunt side, you know. Um, 37 years in urban education will do that to you. I forget sometimes to be nice, but I, I really am not a bad person, I promise. I do have a quick question. Um, I was looking at the amount of points and things like that for the class and the syllabus, and I see that the midterm and final are collectively make up the bulk of the points. So I was seeing like, is there any way besides reading and digesting all the materials that you're giving us, and I've been taking notes on them and watching the videos, is there any other way to really prepare for those? And I've never done a case study either, so I'm also a little nervous about that. So <laughs> any, any tips? Um, you know, honestly, I will open it. I try to open up, I, you know, at the minimum, like I just opened week two for you guys today. Um, so, you know, I try to open up things ahead of time so you can start looking at them. So like that first case study, I'll try to get it open as soon as I can for you. Um, but the, the case studies are really just, I give you a story basically is what it is about a school and you know these are sort of de not sort of they're derived from real life and then you just have some bear some questions about what would you do and why 
Now, the nice thing, honestly, I think about my classes, there's not a right answer. There's wrong answers, but there's not a right answer, if that makes sense. There, you know, school work and um, all of that is very fluid. And there's a lot of different ways to approach it. And as long as you can justify your answer in a way that makes sense, I'm going to give you credit for it. I'm not looking for, you know, the answer is, you know, I don't know. Let's, I'll just make it a percentage, you know. The correct answer is 90%. That's, that's really not how it works. Um, so, like I said, the students tend to do pretty well. And I'm also pretty forgiving, too, that if you really bomb an assignment, um, just let's just talk about it and we'll figure it out. Okay. And then I see someone asked too, how do you access the instructional virtual office? Um, yeah, it's in that first, um, you know, the course is divided. In fact, let me show you that. I wanted to pull that up, so bear with me here. I've got to just move some things around. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you guys. So let's see, which one are we wanting to do? Yeah, that one right there. Okay, share. That one up. Okay, can y'all see um, now my, it says EDL stacked, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly kind of walk you through this and how it works. Now mine's gonna look a little bit different than yours because obviously you don't have over here participants, badges, grades, all that. That's just stuff I have to worry about. But in a nutshell, the way this is, is put together, you'll notice we have our first sort of module thing with the news forum. If I click on that, you can see I posted today about the Zoom meeting. Um, so, you know, you should get those directly in your email, but in, if you don't or if you just want to be double sure, I'd go in here and look. Okay, and I'm just going to use the back button to go back. Then I've got announcements and calendar items, which I posted here about just some tidbits, things that, you know, about the course that I thought would be helpful to you guys. Then you'll see right here the instructor virtual office. So this is a forum and anybody can post in this. So if you just add a new discussion topic, then that's all you have to do. And so you can see we've got some people who've already posted things in here. And if I click on that, I can read the feed basically. So here's what um, Anna posted. And then, um, you know, we've got a couple of responses and you've got my response, et cetera. Okay. So it's really helpful just to kind of click through that pretty frequently. I'm oh, sorry, I gotta go back even more. Okay, so, and then of course, if you, you know, oh gosh, I just need to check the syllabus. I want to look at the weekly calendar, you know, that's there. Um, if you've taken other ed courses at the graduate level, you've probably been required to have a task stream account. You do not have to have a task stream account for me. Um, so you can save yourselves that $25. Okay, so this is what you're working on this week. And it, these are set up pretty consistently from week to week. So you're going to have the welcome and the overview of what we're going to be doing. Um, you won't have all of these pieces because that's just getting started. But if there's some helpful documents you need, it's going to be here. But then I will put in the assignments tab. These are your only assignments, okay? So, if, you know, if you're like, wow, that's not much, then just, just hallelujah, it's not much. Um, so, for example, here you're going to do getting to know you forum. And you'll notice these are hot links. So just click it on. And you can see everybody that has responded. You can also see that I've responded back to everybody. Ah, a couple of people posted since I, I'm so proud of myself that I've done them all. <laughs> a couple of you came in after I stopped. Um, so we'll get those responded to. But all you would do, like in this case, you're gonna answer these questions. So it's click on add a new discussion topic, type in who, you know, whatever is required. And again, mine's gonna look different because I have administrative rights. Um, you know, type, 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 and then where it says for me, post to forum, it'll say that in yours or submit. I'm going to cancel just because I don't want to post again. Okay. And back button again. Another nice, neat little trick is you can also um, click around and go directly to a particular module. Now mine, you see content in module three, but it says right here hidden from students because I haven't opened it up yet. As soon as I can, I will. But let's look at module two. Um, let me go back to module one, sorry. So here's your only assignment. Here's your weekly reading and videos and just your Zoom meeting, okay? 
Then I also put in here important documents and resources so that you have them, as well as this little infographic because this is part of what we're going to be talking about soon. Okay. So let me go back again. It's going to do this. It's probably going to go like, oh, yay. Thought it was going to freeze on me. So in module two, which I've opened up for you, you'll see the same thing. Intro, here's the overview and objectives. Here are your assignments, some articles to read. Here's your actual assignment um, that you're going to do. It's a profile and assessment. And let's just click on that. So what you're going to do, you've got um, some activities you need to do. And what you're actually going to post will be this. Let me see if it's going to let me open it. And there's also, yeah. So this is what you're going to use, do those individual assessments and this is what you're going to post and I need to correct the date on that. I don't know why it has that date. I must have fed over. Let me click out of some of this. Sorry guys. Okay, back over here. Uh, close. Okay. And you'll see that so far nobody's posted, which is fine because I just opened it. And then here's the actual Word document. So when you're ready to, once you do um, these, here's the assessments, here's the instructions, here's the activity. Leadership compass, love languages, and true colors. Do those three first. Then when you get it, you're going to move your results to this. Sorry, it's kind of small. And pretty simply, you're gonna type in your name, the date, and like I said, I need to correct this, so I'll do that here after this. And then you're gonna put in your true colors right here. It'll all make sense once you do this. And then you're going to basically give me some descriptions. So this is your assignment for next week, okay? Pretty simple. Oh, sorry, I gotta go back. I posted in the um, virtual office, uh -huh. and those, on that first tab of that assignment, the getting to know you module two assessments, the link uh -huh. don't work. The first two links don't work. Okay, on this one right here? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let me look here. Yeah, we've had some problems with those. Yeah, so what you can do instead, and thank you for bringing that up, that's, that's important. Let's go back and look at, let me go back here. I didn't know if the last two were the same thing as the links or not, or if they were different. Yeah, it, so I'll try to get the links to work again. But if worst case scenario, if you go to important documents, you'll see that we've got, um, sorry, I have to look at these here. You've got the leadership compass activity. So you can pull it right here and look at it. Sorry, I don't know. Can y'all see that? Is that showing up in your screen, the actual leadership compass activity? Yes. Okay, so let me get rid of that. So you can do that one. Sorry, it's gonna make me do each one of these, close all tabs. No, okay. Then you'll see here is the love languages. So you don't even have to have the links, quite frankly. Here's the, here it is, that you can use that one. And then I thought two colors was in here. Yeah, there it is. So even if the links don't work, you've still got these documents, okay? Does that make sense? Like, yes, so I'll go in and try to fix the links, but sometimes I just, they just don't work. So you've got these as backups. So this is in the important document section? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's called Important Documents and Resources. And All it's right. found. Thank you. Yeah, it's found right here at the bottom. Okay, and then here's how you score the True, work, true Colors Word sort because you'll need that to do the, the diagram. Okay, any other questions guys? But like I said, Moodle's pretty easy to navigate, but when you're gonna post results, like I said, make sure you're doing it actually under the assignments tab. If you post it somewhere else, I'm liable not to see it and I can't grade it, okay? Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see y'all, okay. Oh, and uh, somebody, uh, C. Davis, um, do you have to respond three times on three different days? No, just a total of three other students. That's all. Okay, because I want you reading each other's posts. So that's part of it. Okay. All right. Any other questions? 
right, then we are going to go ahead and do this. Hang on, sorry, my computer's being slow. Uh, Got to move. Sorry, sorry. I hate that it covers you guys up where I can't see you. So I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm going to share the PowerPoint. And unfortunately, just for the sake of time, um, if you get a chance, sorry, it's being slow. There we go. If you get a chance, go scroll through the um, getting to know you. You guys got some great backgrounds, really interesting stuff. So you, even though you don't have to read them on, respond for the grade, um, I would encourage you to do that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on. So like I said, next week, you're going to be doing three assessments, true colors. Um, some of you may have done that before. The four main colors are orange, blue, green, and gold. Um, been used around a long time. What I like about it is they have free ones online that you can use. So you don't have to pay for it. I've used it with teachers. I've used it with principals. I've used it with students. Um, and it can be a really powerful tool. We'll talk more about that next week. Love Languages was originally done as a part of marriage counseling. That's what it was developed for. But you can also apply it to work situations. Um, true color really gives you a great sense of how people approach work. Love languages in the workplace is how people want to give and receive acknowledgement or appreciation. So real important to know when you're working with a team. The compass is sort of what I call the more global view, how people view the world and all of its components. Um, so for example, you know, I've done this a million times, my profile is green, physical touch, east. That means nothing to you right now, um, unless you've gone in, um, I think Catherine has probably looked at these and maybe done some of these. Um, green will tell you I'm a very data-driven, analytical person. Um, you know, I, I don't respond emotionally. I want the facts. You know, data doesn't lie. That's probably why they make me teach the data course. Um, so that's part of my mind. Physical touch, um, you know, I don't care about public recognition. You can write me a nice note and that's great and wonderful, but if you really want me to feel appreciated, give me a high five or, you know, give me a hug or something like that. That's how I like to receive um, acknowledgement. And then in terms of East, I'm a big picture person. I am great at vision setting. I get really frustrated with the details. So I'm not the person to ask if you want a plan of action. But if you need a vision or you need the big picture, that I'm the go-to person, okay? So we'll talk more about these next week and what they mean, but it's important to know and understand how everybody is when you're working with a team. And that'll hopefully come become clearer in the future. Okay, so I'm not gonna to read to you. You guys are perfectly capable of reading yourselves, but um, remember, uh, the whole idea behind the professional learning community was actually started by Rick Dufour, um, and the book, while it's old now, it's, gosh, I feel really old, it's like 20 years old, um, but professional learning communities at work was pretty revolutionary when it came out. Um, and obviously it was significant in that we're still talking about it. Um, but one of the things that I think is most powerful um, from this book and this concept is the fact that there's been now been tons of research about the effectiveness of PLCs. And when they're done right and done well, it, it, there's a direct correlation with improved student achievement, improved climate, improved morale, improved culture, improved organizational management and systems. So it's a really effective model that is basically um, cost-free um, that can be used in pretty much any situation. They've even adapted this now and they're using it in businesses, um, et cetera. So if you're familiar, for example, with um, uh, the Apple Store, if you've ever been to an Apple Store. Um, it's set up very much like a professional learning community. Uh, when you go to the Genius Bar or you take one of their classes, you're going to be talking to a genius and maybe there'll be three, other four, three or four other customers and you're all collaborating around a particular topic or problem. That's the basis um, that's grounded in PLC pedagogy. Okay. Um, again, uh, you know, they've looked at this. Um, some of the big names that, you know, for those of you that are going to be taking a principal certification exam, these are some names you need to know. Uh, DeFore is obviously big. Peter Senge, who was quoted before, but Michael Fullen is also another educational researcher that is very well known. And um, that he said that this really is 
important in transforming the culture of a school. Um, and we'll talk more about the difference between culture and climate a little bit later. Um, here are the attributes of a, a professional learning community that is effective. And I'm not going to, again, read to you, but just a couple of things that an effective PLC is seeking solutions. It's not the gripe fest. Sometimes that's what it becomes, but it's really more about solutions. It is a way to learn. There, it is very much part and parcel of professional development. Um, it's based on continuous improvement, and you have to build in reflection as well as risk taking. Um, in terms of how you create that professional culture, again, we'll go more deep into this, but you know, take some time and just kind of start familiarizing with this. So there has to be um, reflective dialogue, a deprivatization of practice. Um, and let me give you an example of that. So one of the things that we created when I was a, a high school principal was we called it the war room. It was our data room. We were able to set aside a room in the building and that's where all of our PLCs met. And in that room, we were very public about data. Data was posted, I mean, it practically wallpapered the place. And we put every piece of data that was important to us on those walls, including achievement scores by teacher. And a lot of people were like, oh, that's terrible. You know, people are going to get their feeling hurt, feelings hurt, et cetera. But the team made the decision that we had to be that transparent to really understand what was going on. And sometimes we could explain why Ms. Smith had the lowest scores. You know, she had the most students from poverty. She had the most second language learners. She had a lot of barriers. But it helped us to really see where we were doing well and where we weren't, and then we could pinpoint the practice that needed to happen to improve those scores. There has to be time to meet and talk. Um, you know, a lot of times we try to do PLCs, you know, at really bad times, at, after school when teachers are burnt out and tired. Um, so we'll talk more about ways to do that. It also has to really have, whoops, sorry about that, I'm too far, oh, there it is. Um, Trust and respect, and we're going to talk about some ways, very specific ways, to build that at the outset. So I love the fact that this course is in the summer because we're about to start a new school year, so you can actually do this right. So part of what we'll talk about is how do you build a PLC the right way from the ground up. Now, if you're already part of a PLC, how do you get it refocused or how do you get it re-energized? Um, so this is a great time to be doing this, this kind of work. Um, another part of the PLC model is the key question. Some, tell, some people will tell you these are the only questions that you should ever ask. This is the basis for the agenda in a PLC. And they're simple. What do we need to reteach? Who do we need to reteach it to? Why did our students struggle? And how do we reteach it? Um, I don't think that's the only thing you do. Um, there's a lot more to it, but some people will say that, that that's very important. A second model is what are we teaching? Why and how are we teaching it? And how are we going to know if the students will learn? Well, if you're familiar at all with curriculum mapping and those things, you can see um, that what are we teaching is your curriculum and your map. Why and how are we teaching it is your lesson plan. And how are we going to know is how we're, is the assessment piece. And I'm not talking about state assessments. State assessments only give you historical data. And once you get those results, there's not a damn thing you can do about them. They're done, and that's it. So what's more important as the part of a PLC process is that formative assessment that drives instruction. So again, you can tell it's a little bit of a hot topic for me. I hate summative state assessment data. Um, so just some questions to think about. You don't have to um, actually answer these and give them to me. Uh, but you know, I think the question was uh, from Ray. Am I saying your name right, Ray? Okay. Uh, that Ray asked us was, how do I prepare for those case studies? giving you some hints right here. <laughs> these are the kind of things that uh, you're gonna be, you know, we're gonna answer these questions as we go, but you know, just, just start thinking about it. I really believe in um, that, that great pre-reading strategy, you know, where you predict or you have guiding essential questions before you start, here's yours um, for your use, okay? So, real quickly, let me look at my time here, we're doing okay. Um, so, this is an example, we're gonna start and do together our first case study. So here we go. Uh, once upon a time, there was a school, a good high school. It was a large high school with 2,800 students. It was considered the best high school in its parish. Um, and while the school was good and got decent achievement results, 
um, you know, the superintendent felt that something was missing. He knew the school was underperforming. It had opened more than 40 years ago, and it had only had two principals. So talk about, you know, tradition and all that. Knowing the current principal was not going to be able to propel the school forward, the superintendent decided to bring a new principal in. He expected three things. Increase student achievement and earn the state's top ranking, remove and replace underperforming teachers and coaches, and restore discipline, more discipline, order, and pride in the school. Okay, so this is what the new principal is being tasked with. And keep in mind, he or she is walking into a school 40 years into its existence, and they're only the third principal. Okay, so you are the newly appointed principal. How can you use what you've learned? which you haven't probably, you know, I mean, this is really an unfair one to do, but. So what ideas do you guys have? What do you think is gonna be a, some great tools or ideas um, that you can use? And there's no wrong answer. So just chime in, guys. And I will call shamelessly on people too if I have to. <laughs> um, I'll chime in. I like the article that you posted from Ed Leadership and how they took some chart paper and they said, okay, what are some issues that we're having? And they had everybody write maybe why there's low morale or, you know, and get the teacher feedback to get that buy-in as well. And then he made them put little stickers to kind of rate them with priorities. And you kind of started there because as a new principal, you come in and you're like, I don't know what's going on. So you need that feedback, I think, to, to really start, you know, what you're doing with the school to make a difference. Yeah, excellent. Excellent point, right? Okay. Any other ideas? I think you can start with uh, trying to assess where everybody is, what their needs are. You know, some of those personality assessments like you've had and you talked about, if people learn to identify themselves in certain new ways, they start to, I guess they start to think about how they've been underused or underutilized in certain ways or haven't been used in the best way possible. And you might be able to uncover some new leaves with some old, old dogs, so to speak. Yeah, great point, Erin. Absolutely. You and Ray are right on track with exactly the things that need to happen at first. Okay, anybody else? I would, um, hey, Brandon. I would try to figure out how to build their trust because from the video that you showed that you gave us earlier, you can't build their trust, nothing's gonna happen. Yeah, great point. There's two kinds of trust that as a leader of a school or a leader, teacher leader, that you have to build. One is relational, the other is organizational. And without those two elements in place, you can do the most wonderful plan, you can do all these great things, but it's not going to be effective. Trust is critically important. And part of the way that you build trust is by leveraging the culture of the school along with the climate to create a place where everybody knows that their voice is heard. And we'll talk specifically about what that looks like a little bit later on. Any other ideas? Um, also, I, I had typed out that the, the principal can go to the data for teachers and see where there are areas of weakness. Um, and this would be easy in a collaborative culture where um, the teachers are used to the principal coming in and chatting with them about student performance. Exactly. Great point. Okay. Well, this story is a real life story. Um, this was my first high school principalship. Um, I was the only the third principal in, like I said, more than 40 years. And on top of that, I was female. And to make it even worse, I was, um, I was hired out from outside the district. I wasn't an internal promotion, which everybody expected the assistant principal to be promoted to principal. And um, there were a lot of challenges. In fact, the very first thing, it was my second day on the job, the superintendent calls me and he says, I need you to fire the um, baseball coach. I'd never even met the baseball coach. I didn't even know his name. Um, and I thought, well, that's going to be a really popular thing to do. But, you know, um, when he told me the reasons, uh, he was absolutely right. Um, the former principal would not address issues and problems. Um, and so I called this man and I'm like, hi, you know, 
I'm Tracy and you know I'm the new principal and by the way you're fine uh, it didn't go quite like that but um, you guys hit on some great points because the first thing I did was I did a deep dive data analysis and looked at who were my performers who were my underperformers and all of those pieces I didn't share that with anybody that was really just for me sorry just reminding me of our time limits here um, where we were going then, like I said, I did. I started meeting in small groups, um, and they were diverse groups. I would bring in just random people from different departments and stuff. And we did what is called a plus delta activity. The plus is what's everything that's great about this school and that's working. Real simple, just a plus. These are all our positives. Then the deltas were all those things that, and we did it on big chart paper. And I all I did was I was the scribe, just listen. I didn't didn't respond, nothing. All the things that they felt like were problems. Then we used the sticky notes or the nominal group technique where everybody got to vote, they had a voice, on from the deltas, what were those things that were the most pressing problems so we could narrow it down. Once I did that, I did it with every single faculty member in small groups, I did it with parents, I did it with students, I did it with community members, I did it with the office staff, I did it with custodians. You know, I spent about two weeks nonstop doing this. Once it was all done, we typed all the pluses up, all the deltas up, accumulated all the results, and we had a pretty clear idea of where we needed to focus. And in doing that and getting everybody involved, it like Brandon said, it gave me relational trust right off the bat because I didn't exclude anybody. And everybody got the same voice, whether you were the department chair or you were, you know, the teacher that's only been there a year. Everybody got a voice. The other thing that I did that really helped to build that trust was I was very relational. Uh, apparently, the former principal never, ever, ever went into a classroom, ever. <laughs> I mean, literally ever. And so from the first day of school on, I went to every single classroom. And this is a big high school. That was hard. I had 200 teachers. I went to every single classroom and just, hey, saying hi, everything okay, you know, whatever. And I found out things like if the air conditioning is not working in this room, that I, you know, I, you know, the teachers would tell me I, had, I kept my pad. And I would make sure those things got taken care of. So not only did I get that, that, organizational trust I got that relational trust so a lot of things began to happen the next step was as part of our professional development we'd have everybody do those assessments just like I'm asking you guys to do and we put it on our name tags so you know on my name tag I had a green dot I don't remember our symbols we used. we each had three little stickers and it really helped me especially because blue is considered the more um, empathetic, emotional, you know, people really care about what other people think and they feel. Well, the running joke for my whole career has been that I have no blue at all in me. And so it really helped me when I was talking to my art teacher, which I think was 1000% blue, that I had to really kind of soften my tone and, you know, be very different than my normal way of just saying, hey, you just need to do this. But it really helped us to communicate. And we even did that with our students. And we went through those assessments as part of our advisory program. Um, and from there, we didn't even start PLCs. This took us a good three months to get just those things done. Then we were able to create PLCs that made sense. And we'll talk more about those sort of organizational structures that we built in. Um, you know, we became a National Leader of in School of Excellence. And one of the commendations we got was our organizational plans and charts that involved everybody as a stakeholder. Um, so, you know, we were really proud of that, that the team created. Okay, all right, so in our last couple of minutes here, what questions, comments, or concerns do y'all have? I'm gonna turn off the sh sharing so we can actually see everybody again. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at this. Yeah, and this is really kind of funny because I'm reading here. Somebody says that if the school sees you as an outsider, they won't work, outsider, they won't work with you. Um, I didn't know this till probably two, three years into the principalship when one of my assistant principals told me because I went from um, being a middle school principal in Dallas to being a high school principal in Irving. Um, and 
I don't know what they thought about people that had worked in the Dallas school district, but they all had bets on what I looked like and, you know, whether I was black or white or Hispanic, I, I don't know. Um, and apparently the first day that I'm walking into the school, they're all lined up at the windows with their little faces, you know, going, is that her? Is that her principal? It just was ridiculous. Um, so yeah, especially when you come from the outside, um, people, kind of the way it works, if you're happy with the status quo, you hire internally. If you need a change agent, you go outside, um, you know, just in terms of hiring and stuff. And so, uh, you know, clearly I was brought in to be a change agent. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of issues that first year. Um, it was so bad, our discipline was, we were having two to three fights a day, a day. I mean, I'm not talking just, a, I'm talking a brawl. Um, you know, we had gangs throughout the school. Um, and everybody there believed they didn't have gangs. And I'm like, seriously, people get a grip. Um, but, you know, like I said, I'm very proud at the end of we really worked through our issues. And um, the school just, we were named the best school in the country by the Intel Foundation four years later. Um, and it had nothing to do with me. It was really, we were able to build this just phenomenal team and family. Um, you know, in fact, they still call those years when we were all together at, at MacArthur and Irving um, the golden years of the school. Uh, we have uh, we had 2,800 students. We've got a Facebook page from that era where we've got over 5,000 people subscribed to because uh, it was just really cool. Right place, right time, great people made all the difference in the world. Okay. Yeah, if your school culture's tanked, I, I, we need to talk. There's some things we can do. Yeah, and it does take leadership, strong leadership, absolutely. You know, and you know, and I will tell you too. Yeah, you know, at the end of my first year as principal, um, I had 200 staff members. I lost 34 of them to retirement or resignations. And you know, I came from an environment in Dallas where they kept score. You know, if you had that much teacher turnover, it was not a good thing. And I got a, I got a call from my superintendent, and he's like, Tracy, I need to talk to you about you know the number of faculty and staff you lost. I thought, oh gosh, here it goes. And he said, congratulations, good job. It needed to happen. Sometimes, you know, you have to, you have to. People either get on the bus or get out of the way. <laughs> oh, somebody asked me, is asking about if they're blue, can that be a downfall as a leader? No, absolutely not. I know some extremely effective principals who are very blue. They just approach leadership differently. That's all it is. Yeah, I'm seeing several of you say. It's not unusual. I was probably more blue when I was a teacher in the classroom, but then I became the jaded, mean administrator. Um, you know, because I spent 16 years in the principalship. Um, by choice, I loved being a principal. So yeah, I did probably, I changed, and you will, you'll find that. Um, I changed to become very green because my role changed. When I was the dean of students, I was very gold because all the details came to me. I'm more gold now, again, um, than I used to be because of my role here at LSUS. I'm the special events coordinator and I do strategic partnerships and all this other stuff. So there has to be detail. So yeah, don't, I mean, blues, blues are very strong, very, very strong leaders, just different than those of us that aren't. Okay, I'm trying to read the feed as we go too. Yeah, good place, yeah. Are they high school or low school? My administrative team and I, about two months into the year, we went through and we ranked all of our teachers, and we're gonna talk about how to do that, um, whether they were willing and unable, um, able and willing, unable and unwilling. Um, and there's one other one I'm gonna forget. But anyway, we ranked all of our teachers, we put them into quadrants, and those that were unwilling and unable meant that they had a bad attitude, they weren't willing to work with us, but they were also rotten teachers. Guess what? They got a lot of attention. And you either grow or you go. And most of them self-selected out, but we did actually terminate some people. And don't tell me you can't terminate teachers because of contract law. You can. I've done it. So anyway, kind of got off track. I'm sorry. Too many war stories. What else, what other questions or comments do you guys have before we close it out tonight? To respond. 
Oh, okay, so somebody wants to know about to respond to three classmates. Um, when you put your assessment up in module two, the leadership profile, yes, it will be visible to others. That's by design, guys, um, because we're gonna build some virtual teams, um, at least kind of, sort of, but anyway. So yeah, part of the whole idea of doing those profiles, because again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's not being one type's better than another. They're all equally good. They all have their strengths. They all have their weaknesses. And I just want us to see um, what those look like, okay? Okay, any other questions, guys? If I've missed any on here, I'm just trying to look at the feed real quick. Okay, one last question, just because sure. I'm really OCD about assignments, because I see it has a due date. But those personal readings, it says delivery method, just personal readings, but it has a due date. That just means you want us to read it by that date, right? There's no assignment link to it. Okay. Yeah, and, and you don't even have to read it by that date, because A, I'm not going to know if you do or not, because I'm not grading you on it. Um, and B, like I said, you're grown-ups, you know, I, I trust you to do what you need to do. I give that date for reading assignments, just again, so you don't get overwhelmed, um, you know. But I understand too, like, hey, I'm going to Disney this week and I don't want to think about school. That's fine. Because um, I will tell you, it was really painful when last year at this time when I was in um, the Florida Keys and sitting on the beach going, damn, I got a grade, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Um, but I did make my students feel sorry for me because I showed them the picture of the beach when we did our Zoom meeting. <laughs> so, but yeah, I get it. It's summer, do what you gotta do. It's just to keep you on track, so. Okay, awesome. I am building a house and selling a house and I have a 16 month year old. So, you know, it's, you know <laughs> life's, going on. Life's, life's crazy. So, okay, yeah. perfect, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I see somebody said they're in hurricane prep mode. Um, God bless y'all. Um, yeah, it, who knows what's going to happen in New Orleans. Um, if you guys lose internet, that's okay. If you can't get your assignments in, I know you can't pre-warn me. Um, you know, I understand what's going on. In fact, I, I emailed our dean a little while ago. She's probably going to put something out to everybody um, about the fact that we're probably going to lose some of our students, at least their connectivity with us. Um, so, yeah. Good luck, guys. I feel for you. They're saying we may move up north this weekend, but I know we're not going to get nearly what y'all do. So yeah, prayers and love to you guys down in the south part of the state. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Okay. Did you, yes. I'm sorry. Did you get to see my message about the um, APA papers? I know you said that we did not need to have a cover page or abstract. What were the requirements again? Uh, it's just going to be your essay with in-text citations. So it's like, you know, if you quote DeFore, you just put in parentheses, DeFore, comma, 1998. Um, and so that's how you do that. Then you'll have to have your um, bibliography or reference page. That's it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off to those of you that live in the, the south um, part of Louisiana and on over into Mississippi. Um, we're certainly saying some prayers for you guys. I hope it, it's not as bad as it could be. So stay safe and um, we'll see you guys next week. Bye.